How does one even try to describe the world of fairies? Well, at least in the case of John Crowley, it was uh, over 500 pages worth to try and do it. Hey there everybody, Patreon sponsored review, and it's a book! It's been a little while since I've been commissioned on one of those, or uh, actually it's been a little while since I've been working on reading this. Uh, I've been working on this one for a while. This is a, uh, a rather thick book, and the way that it is written makes for slow going. That is not necessarily the criticism you might be thinking. I will explain when I get there. But first, let me explain what this thing is uh, a little bit, or at least attempt to. So the book is called Little Big. It was written in the early 80s by a guy by the name of John Crowley, or Crowley, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I'm going with Crowley. And this is both an author and a book I had never heard of before I was commissioned. Apparently this is considered by some to be something of a um, of a lost sort of um, fantasy masterpiece uh, and it, it didn't get, it didn't do badly but it didn't get a ton of recognition at the time. It sort of had a bit of a resurgence in more recent times so it seems to be getting a, a little bit more appreciation for what it is. It's a very unique book at least in terms of anything that I've ever read before. So, <laughs> I need to try and decide how I'm going to summarize it in a broad sense before I start really digging into my thoughts on it. This book is a... It's not quite magical realism. It kind of straddles the line between magical realism and low fantasy. Uh, if you don't know fantasy terms... Uh, fantasy genre terminology. High fantasy is when you're dealing with a completely originally created world, like say, you know, your Middle Earth, your Lord of the Rings, etc. Low fantasy is when you're dealing with more or less the real world with fantasy elements in it, i.e. your Harry Potters, your Dresden Files. Uh, and then magical realism is uh, a setting where magic exists, but it's not treated like anything exceptional. It's just it's just there, and it, it it's usually in a very incredibly low key way. And this is kind of rides the line between magical realism and low fantasy, and. It, as I said, it's a multi-generational story focusing on the members of the Drinkwater family, both the biological and the ones who marry, and we actually start with a character named Smokey, who um, is going to wed a woman named Alice, uh, referred to as Daily Alice, and um, that's sort of our in his first learning about this family and the a place where, where they live called Edgewood, and that home and its history is sort of the way in which the reader gets introduced to all the concepts that are going on. And we learn about the family, about its interaction with the very complicated and uh, in in many ways sort of non-linear and uh, to human eyes not particularly cohesive um, world of fairies, what happens to some family members when they venture away from Edgewood and live in a city. There's also some stuff going on on a grander scale towards the end, but I'll, I'll kind of come back to that a little bit. But it's a difficult book to try and sum up, and you'll notice as far as the um, storyline goes, I've talked in pretty broad strokes. There's a couple of reasons for that. The first is uh, it's a multi-generational story, so there are a lot of characters uh, to deal with. There is no one central character, which honestly for me is something that took uh, a little getting used to, because at the front end of it, um, Smokey is our lead-in, and then it's, you know, it kind of expands to him and Daily Alice. Okay, Daily Alice's sister, Sophie, you know, that, you know, their family, we get a little background in history. I'm like, okay, but then latter half of the book and we start dealing with Smokey and Alice's kids and the and focusing so much on them and not like as kids still living at home like as adults living lives it it really did feel like a bit of a jolt for me 
I suspect that's kind of how multi-generational stories tend to go. That's not a, a type of fiction I'm used to reading, so that threw me off a little, but I don't think that was any kind of issue with the book. Um, but the main reason why it's difficult to try and explain and describe this book, and also the reason why it took me a very long time to read it, um, you know, beyond even what the page count should have taken me, is the way in which it's written. It is written in what I can only think to describe as borderline poetic, dense uh, literary narrative. So I, I kept coming across and thinking the phrase, this reads like poetry. But I really need to clarify and explain that because it doesn't read like poetry for the reasons people might normally say that. People have a tendency to say that when something is written in overly flowery language or really purple prose or things like that. And that's not really the case here. I'm not going to say there's none of that, but when I say it reads like poetry, what I mean is if you've ever read a poem that was intending to convey any kind of story. You generally come away from that with a sense of the events, you know, A happened, then B happened, then C happened. But what you come away with much more strongly is a feel of what happened. Maybe you couldn't chart it out on a, on a narrative breakdown and pick apart the structure, but you know how you were left feeling about what you know that occurred. And that's the way the narrative of this thing comes across. At the end of any given section, I oftentimes would realize that not a lot had actually happened. And I wasn't entirely sure how well I could have explained it if you'd asked me. But I still came away with very distinct feelings, regardless. Very distinct impressions and emotions being stirred and general vibe off of the characters and the events going on. All of that is very much at the forefront of it as a reading experience. And it took me a little while to get on the wavelength of this book. And also I am going to recommend, so slight peek behind the curtain here. Um, when I get commissioned to do books, I will make use of audiobook if I'm in a time crunch, but even on the occasions where I've done that, it was only for parts of the book in question. I try and do as much of the reading from the actual text as I can, as I can find the time to do. Um, but this is a case where, spoiler, I'm, I am going to have some reasons to recommend this book, depending on what your tastes are. I'm not going to recommend the audiobook to anybody. All due respect to the man, John Crowley did the reading of it himself, and it doesn't work. The, the, the way it's written is so unusual that combined with the fact that he's just not a great reader uh, of it to listen to, the, and it, the whole thing turned me off. And, but, but I, I, thankfully I did realize it was just listening to him that was throwing me off, not the actual book. And when I basically had to chuck this is why this took me so long i had to chuck the audiobook in the bin and not even use it to try and catch up and make up for time for segments and pretty much read the whole thing legit which made me appreciate it much much more uh, in this particular case and once you are in tune with the narrative and you get used to the idea of it it's not actually necessary for me to go back and reread the section because I feel like I'm not entirely sure what happened. As long as you know what you feel about it, you're okay to keep moving forward. And it was a very interesting experience to read because of that. Um, and like I said, a very unique one. There are portions of it that, you know, rang very true and like, gave me things to think about and feelings that were that were quite deep. Um, and the way it's broken down is is interesting as well. It's the the novel is broken down into I think it's five yeah uh, no it's six books, each book consisting of four or five chapters and each 
chapter being broken into named segments, which could last from anywhere from half a page to 10 pages. So, um, you know, this thing just breaks a lot of the standard structure of what you'd expect. Aside from the learning curve of getting a handle on the writing style, I do have a couple of things that I do feel are more legitimate criticisms of it, um, more so than just you need to get used to it. So the first is, part of this it just likely has to do with the time in which it was written, like I said, early 80s, but um, it is a little bit male gaze at times, um, not in a especially creepy or overt way. However, by the time it was done, I was really noticing how often the visible uh, sexual characteristics of female characters were being remarked on versus the fact that it was basically never mentioned for the male characters. And again, it's not like it's all the time, but I, I really was noticing by the end, it's like, what, there was no need to point that out, you know, point out that somewhat sexualized element of the character in that moment, but you did anyways. Um, so there's a little bit of that going on. And the other thing is, um, there are, in the, in the second half of the book that takes place in a city, as opposed to this, you know, remote, um, uh, this remote location of Edgewood, there are some, there are a number of non-white characters, and a lot of them have phonetically written accents, which, I'm not sure I'm going to make the argument that doing that is an inherently bad idea, but I know for me as a reader, um, it can often um, put me off, and in this case, it, it definitely did. Um, beyond that, there's, in terms of the sexualized aspects, and there isn't a ton. I wouldn't say this is like an adults-only book, but it is kind of dealing with more mature themes of family and how things connect and the overall journey of one's life. You know, things that I think younger readers probably wouldn't wouldn't have the background and the life experience to properly appreciate, even if they could they could wrap around the language. There's there's a character named Oberon. Well, actually, there's two characters named Oberon, but Oberon the Elder. See what I mean by a, by a big cast, multi generational. Oberon the Elder uh, is is also a character who made me slightly uncomfortable. Not so much in that what went on with him, but it felt like the book, I. I kind of needed the narrative to judge him a bit more than it does. So, as quickly as I can put it, he basically engages in fairy photography. Um, and around that time period, if, if you know about the, like, the fairy photographs craze, of it was like the 1920s-ish kind of time period, and photos uh, from people like Lewis Carroll, um, you know, of young children with fairies. Well, Oberon the Elder did that, and... He, his way of going about that, while it is presented as innocently as it can be, it is uncomfortably sexual as he's photographing these children. And I'm not going to say that, that like that's okay for the character to be that way. I don't know how I feel about that. I will say, though, it made me very uncomfortable that it, it read to me like the narrative and the story thought that this was not a big deal. Um, simply because he never laid a hand on the girls uh, and the children involved. Which is good! Um, that, like, if that had happened, I, I might have had to close the book and gotten in touch with the uh, person who commissioned and said, I can't finish this. But I, I kind of needed the book, I needed somebody, a character or a general sense from the narrative that, like, yeah, he doesn't get why this is not right, but it's not right. Let's so the fact that that didn't happen made me slightly uncomfortable. Thankfully, though, it's it, his section of what I'm talking about is a very it's a it's like I don't know this much of the book. It's not a lot, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. The thing is, 
the way in which it's written is, a, for me, a much bigger sell than the actual story. Although, the way in which it layers and explores the idea of fairies, and particularly the ways in which the world of the fairies overlaps with this family, I find really interesting. And it especially kind of gels with me in a certain way because this family basically has to take a lot on faith because they... <laughs> they are not fully going to understand what is going on with this other realm and this other world and these other beings. They can try, and some of them even think that they will have some revelation and they will understand, but they're not going to. They never will. But they're still intertwined in all of this. They have a role in a story, and they know, and this family knows they have a role in the story, but some of them think it's a role that is something other than what it is. Some of them flat out don't know what their role is at all. Um, some of them know, but that knowing comes with realizing that they're just a very small part of something. Uh, and that sort of almost bordering on existentialism, but like not tipping over into the more depressing elements that that tends to lend, um, I found to be really fascinating in terms of the way it connected the characters to each other and to this more magical realm. It was, it was just presented really well. It, and like I said, it's incredibly well written and it's the kind of thing that for as long as it took me to read, I could see myself reading again, which I don't say about many books, but I'm gonna add the caveat, I suspect I would probably only read the first half of it again. It's not that the second half is bad, but this is going to sound like a weird criticism. The second half is where the plot happens. And the book is at its best and at its most, for lack of a less cliched term, magical. In the first half, as you're just getting to know what little bits that you will ever understand about these connections and these worlds and these people and this house. God, the way Edgewood is described is incredible. And getting to know that is really what grabbed me. And then, in the latter half, actual story kicks in, even including a char some characters who might arguably be villains. And I remember getting to the point where these characters get introduced and thinking, what are you even doing here? This story doesn't need villains. This story doesn't need a bigger conflict. Like, what? what is this? Why is this even here? And it doesn't derail things. It just did not feel like a natural progression of what had been going on. It it just it felt it felt like a forced element in order to grant a climax towards the end. Not like it all happened at the end. Like I said, it started happening in the latter half. It was just it was just odd. But that first half of the book, especially, is magical. And after that, like I said, it doesn't fall apart by any means, but once it actually starts having a discernible plot that's moving forward, it's it loses just a little bit of, of the touch that's going on there. But all that said, I do want to stress, I am very happy I read this. For a not dissimilar to reason to why I'm very happy that I read The Last Unicorn, although I, The Last Unicorn I did enjoy quite a bit more, which is that it's incredibly well crafted and the, what it is doing and the way in which it is telling its story is distinct and unlike nearly anything else that I've ever read. And for that alone, I am glad to have read it. But even beyond that, I, do, I did take enjoyment out of this and just getting to experience a very different way of conveying characters and story that left me Again, like I said, unsure of what had happened, but certain in how I felt about it. That was such a strange reading experience, but it's one I'm really glad that I had. I don't know if anybody watching has read this, but if you have, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. If you haven't, um, if any of what I said sounded interesting, give it a shot. Just don't listen to the audiobook. <laughs> So, that'll do it, folks. Little Big. Have you read it or heard about it or know of anything similar to it? 
Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Bunch of stuff to do, to do down there as well, because there's buttons, links. There's the Patreon I mentioned at the front end. This was a Patreon commissioned book. And if you have something you want me to watch or read, you could do the same thing. Or you could support me at any level. It helps. It really does. But you don't have to go that far. You can like, subscribe, share. But you also don't have to do that either. Because at the end of the day, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.